What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about nephritic syndrome, which is one of those types of glomerulonephritis. Before we get started, I really want us to kind of get into talking a little bit about you know, the, the, the anatomy, the function of the glomerular filtration barrier. I think it's really critical to understanding nephritic syndrome. Before we actually start getting into that, I want you guys to please, if you guys find this video beneficial, helpful, please support us. Hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, subscribe if you guys have the opportunity. Also, if you guys want some great notes, some illustrations to follow along with me during this lecture, go down in the description box below. It'll take you to our website. We've got some great notes, some great illustrations that I think will really be helpful to follow along with me. But let's start talking about nephritic syndrome. So first things first, when we have the anatomy of the glomerular filtration barrier, right, it's really, really critical to understand this because it really describes the pathophysiology, the basics behind nephritic syndrome. And what really is, there's three components of the glomerular filtration barrier. And what are these? I'm going to abbreviate this as GFB, if you will. So glomerular filtration barrier. There's three components of it. The first one is this capillary, which is beautifully fenestrated. What does that mean? It means it's got little pores, which allows for plasma and certain things in the plasma filtrate to filter out of the blood and into the Bowman space, right? That's one of part of the filtration barrier. So we have what's called the fenestrated capillaries, if you will. All right, so that's one part of the barrier that controls the blood flow and the certain things within the blood from leaking out into the actual Bowman space. Really good at that, especially big proteins and red blood cells, etc. The second component of the glomerular filtration barrier is this big blue molecule here. What's that? That's called the glomerular basement membrane. This sucker is so cool, and the reason why is the proteins that make this membrane up give a very heavy negative charge. So it's very heavily negatively charged. And one of the cool things about that is that proteins, most proteins in our body are negatively charged. And so negative charge, negative charges, they're the same charge, they're gonna repel one another. And that's really good at preventing very large negatively charged plasma proteins from leaking across the blood plasma into the Bowman space. The third part of the glomerular filtration barrier, my friends, is these cute little cells. You see these cells right here that are kind of like lining right on top of that, that barrier there? What are these cells called? These are called your podocytes. These are called your podocytes. And the podocytes, if you kind of look, you see how they have like these little divots. That's called their little foot processes. And there's little spaces between those podocytes called filtration slits. And that's also supposed to give a little bit of permeability to this GFB, but not so much where big things like red blood cells and big proteins and white blood cells leak out. So this is your podocytes. And again, the big thing that I want you to remember that plays a role within the permeability here is the filtration slits. Now, the whole job of the glomerular filtration barrier, right, is to prevent large things from leaking out. We want some things to leak across this barrier. We want things like small amino acids, glucose, sodium, electrolytes, water, certain types of metabolic waste products to filter across here to be peed out, right? We don't want that stuff in the body. And so we're supposed to allow that to happen, but what we don't want to cross over is the glomerular filtration barrier is supposed to block the passage of red blood cells, white blood cells, and proteins. Here's the problem though. In a disease called nephritic syndrome, so when someone has nephritic syndrome, good old nephritic syndrome, what happens in this disease is it causes damage to a very specific thing. It damages the glomerular basement membrane, which I'm gonna abbreviate as GBM. So it causes GBM damage or dysfunction. Now here's the problem. When you have glomerular basement membrane damage, what happens is you jack up this glomerular filtration barrier. It's normally supposed to block the passage of red blood cells, white blood cells, and proteins. But now you introduce a little caveat here in nephritic syndrome. You introduce glomerular 
basement membrane damage or dysfunction. And then what ends up happening is you lose the capacity to control what leaves the blood and goes into the Bowman space. And then what starts leaking out is you start having the leakage of everything that you could imagine. You leak out red blood cells, you leak out white blood cells, and you leak out proteins. And that's the problem that we see in nephritic syndrome. In nephrotic syndrome, if you guys remember, it was damage to the podocytes. And when there was podocyte dysfunction, it just caused heavy proteinuria. In nephritic syndrome, where there's glomerular basement membrane damage or dysfunction, it's proteinuria, subnephrotic range, hematuria, and sterile pyuria. Now let's talk about the next component here, which is we have a patient with nephritic syndrome, right? Well, what we know is, is in this disease process, we're gonna have glomerular basement membrane damage. So there's damage to this good old GBM, this, this molecule right here. So here is our glomerular basement membrane. And this thing is all jacked up. So there's glomerular basement membrane damage. So there's injury to this glomerular basement membrane, right? Now, when you damage the glomerular basement membrane, what we said is, is you lose the ability to control what things are leaking out. And what are some of these things that start leaking out? One of them, as we said, is red blood cells. These start leaking out. Another thing that starts leaking out here is white blood cells. And the last thing that starts leaking out here is proteins. And that is the big, big factor here, because whenever you end up actually looking at these patients' urine, what ends up happening is, and one of the big, big differences here, is that these patients get a lot of red blood cells in their urine. What is it called when you get a lot of red blood cells in the urine? We call this hematuria. We call this hematuria. And that's one particular problem. So whenever there's glomerular basement membrane damage, there is an increase in the loss of particular things. This leads to red blood cell loss, white blood cell loss, and protein loss. But here is the big, big difference. The protein loss is not as much in nephrotic, is not as much as you compare to a nephr uh, nephrotic syndrome. In nephrotic syndrome, it was greater than 3.5 grams per day. In nephritic syndrome, nephritic syndrome, it's less than 3.5 grams per day. And that is where one of these overarching things come from. So you have lots of red blood cell loss, a lot of white blood cell loss, a lot of protein loss, but the protein loss is subnephrotic range. To add on a little bit here, when you get a lot of these red blood cells that get in the urine, what happens is they cause the hematuria, right? But what happens is these red blood cells, they get stuck in the kidney tubules and they take on the shape of the kidney tubule. They make these long tubes of red blood cells. You know what we call that? So whenever we have these red blood cells and they take on the shape of the kidney tubules, they give you this weird kind of configuration. And we call this red blood cell casts. This is highly specific for glomerular disease, especially nephritic syndrome. Another way that these red blood cells can present in the urine is when you look at them, they look like they're all spurry. Like they look like they've just been beaten up. And we call this acanthocytes. We call this acanthocytes. So this is another way that we can see these poor little kind of red blood cells being lost into the urine. So hematuria in the form of red blood cell casts or acanthocytes is very common for nephritic syndrome. The other thing is you're gonna have a lot of white blood cells in the urine, all right? Now, the thing is, is I really want us to be very specific here. This is called sterile pyuria. And the reason why it's crucial to mention this is you're gonna get a lot of these white blood cells that are gonna just be able to fit across, you know, the glomerular filtration barrier. And you're gonna have a lot of these, all right? So you have a lot of red blood cell casts, a lot of acanthocytes, a lot of white blood cells. But here's the big difference, because you can get a lot of white blood cells in urinary tract infections. The big difference is, is I'm gonna have an increase in white blood cells in the urine, but I'm going to have no 
uh, positivity, or I'm going to have decreased amounts of what's called, I'm going to have less bacteria. So I won't have as much of the bacteria that makes me think that it's a urinary tract infection. And I'm going to have less leukocyte esterase that's positive and less nitrites, which are positive. All of these things are suggestive of a urinary tract infection. So you're going to have, let's actually, just so we don't confuse it, you'll have decreased bacteria. Your leukocyte esterase will be negative and your nitrites will be negative, but you'll have a lot of white blood cells in the urine. This is also suggestive of nephritic syndrome. The last one here is you're going to have a lot of protein urea. But again, this protein urea is less than 3.5 grams per day. And why I want to mention this is that you're not going to have as significant of the hypoalbuminemia, the low antithrombin 3, and the low immunoglobulins. And so what I want to mention in this one here is, you see this, you see this, but what you will not see is there isn't going to be, there will be no significant hypoalbuminemia, no significant antithrombin 3 deficiency, and no significant immunoglobulin loss. And that's the big difference here. There isn't going to be this very low albumin in the blood. There isn't going to be this very low antithrombin 3 in the blood. And there isn't going to be this very low immunoglobulins in the blood. The reason why that's important is because these are going to be more suggestive of nephrotic syndrome. So therefore, in these patients, you're not going to be seeing the edema factor, the DVTPE, and the infection factor. And so that's important. There won't be as much edema, secondary to hypoalbuminemia. There won't be a lot of lipids secondary to the hypoalbuminemia. There won't be a lot of DVTs and PEs and renal vein thrombosis, and there won't be a lot of infections. So this is why it's really important and helpful to differentiate. So because there's no significant loss of these particular things, you won't see these particular effects in nephritic syndrome. And that is crucial that I need you guys to remember that, okay? The next thing here that's really helpful, that is really, really good, is that in patients who have nephrotic syndrome, we talked about this in that video, I just wanna quickly recap this, that we said that nephrotic syndrome can lead to, it can potentially lead to chronic kidney disease. And if you guys remember, we said that that was with which particular ones? Focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, amyloid nephropathy. So there is an increased risk of CKD. With nephritic syndrome, with nephritic syndrome, there is a very high risk, much higher, much, much higher, of first off, acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease and CKD, I mean, and nephritic syndrome. So you're gonna have a much higher incidence of kidney injury, renal failure, in patients with nephritic syndrome than you would in nephrotic syndrome, but realize that there's both the possibility. Okay. The next thing that I want you guys to understand here is that when you cause so much of this GBM damage, it leads to a lot of white blood cells, proteins. So you're going to get a lot of specific molecules in this space here. What do we call this space here? This is called Bowman's space. You're going to get a lot of proteins and a lot of white blood cells in there. So you're going to get a lot of white blood cells, a lot of proteins, a lot of cytokines. And this is the problem with this disease. When these things get out here, what they do is they promote a very nasty process where they increase a lot of fibrosis, a lot of sclerosis and epithelial cell proliferation. So what are the things that they're going to do? They're going to increase fibrosis and sclerosis and epithelial cell proliferation. Let's write that down. It's going to cause fibrosis 
and sclerosis, and it's going to cause what's called epithelial cell proliferation. Now, what does that look like? All right, ready? First thing that happens is the epithelial cells, these ones here. So you know how we have the podocytes, which are the visceral layer? You know what this layer is called? The parietal layer of the Bowman's capsule. These start proliferating like crazy because of all of these cytokines and inflammation and white blood cells in the area. And look what happens. They start just like taking up so much space with inside of the actual Bowman's uh, capsule. So there's one thing, there's the epithelial cell proliferation. Let's add on even more problems. Let's add in all this like scarring, the fibrosis and the sclerosis to this area here. Oh my gosh, this looks absolutely terrible. But you know what it kind of takes the shape of, which is kind of odd, is if you look at it, it kind of takes the shape, if you will, of a crescent, all right? Looks like a crescent. And so what we call this is this leads to this crescent formation. This leads to crescent formation. And this crescent formation is really, really scary. You don't wanna see it. Whenever you see a lot of these crescents, these glomerular crescents that are starting to form, it's suggestive of impending renal failure. So this is called your glomerular crescents. What happens then is that imagine now being able to filter things across this glomerular basement membrane now, all of this area here. What do you think is gonna happen to the glomerular filtration rate. <laughs> it's gonna suck. It's gonna drop, man. And so you're gonna have a drop in the glomerular filtration rate. If you have a drop in the glomerular filtration rate, imagine all the particular problems that you're gonna have. You're not gonna be able to get things across this thick barrier here. All of this is going to be inhibited or impeded because of these nasty crescents. And so what happens with these crescents is this leads to something, at least a very scary disease. It leads to a disease which is called rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And this can lead to renal failure. That is the problem and that is the fear of nephritic syndromes. Is that you can literally cause these crescents to block up the flow of filtrate, drop the GFR. Now, here's the thing. When you drop off your GFR, what's all the negative problems with that? Well, one of them is that a low GFR, if I were to bring this one down here, a low GFR is kind of problematic, man. It does a lot of nasty things. One is you're supposed to filter out waste products. You know, these are things that you're supposed to be filtering out. Are you gonna filter them out anymore? Nope. And then all these waste products, such as your blood urea nitrogen and your creatinine, guess what's gonna happen? they're gonna build up. And then as a result now, I'm gonna have a lot of azotemia. But when these levels get really, really high, they can lead to something. They can lead to something called uremia, where they can start causing neurological dysfunction, platelet dysfunction, pericarditis, all that great stuff. The other thing is, is that a low GFR, not only will it stimulate this particular process, not only can it stimulate this particular process because you don't filter these molecules out, but it also can activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If I activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, what does that do? If I stimulate this, doesn't this kind of go and cause angiotensin II to be increased? cause aldosterone, ADH, all of those to be increased? Yeah. If that happens, what is that gonna do to my blood pressure? Oh, it's gonna shoot that blood pressure up. And so these patients end up with very high blood pressure. So we can end up with high blood pressure as a result. What's that called? Hypertension, so let's write that down. Hypertension. So we can see high blood pressure as a result of this low GFR. All right, so we can have uremia. Let's actually make this in a nice black color here so it's the same as all of these. So we can have uremia, potentially as the result of a low GFR. We can have hypertension as the result of a low GFR. What's the last thing that we could have as a result of a low GFR? The last thing is you don't filter sodium water across the glomerulus if you don't have a good GFR. And so you end up building up your sodium and water. 
What happens if you build up sodium and water? This will lead to edema. And that's the last effect that you could get here. So you can get a lot of problems with this low GFR, is you can get hypertension, edema, and uremia. And what is this from again? This is from a lot of these white blood cells, these proteins, these cytokines being released over because of what? Because of GBM damage or dysfunction. This thing is damaged, it's causing a lot of these things to leak out into the space. Creating an inflammatory reaction which leads to fibrosis and epithelial cell proliferation. You make these nasty crescents. They block off the filtrate flow. That can lead to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which can lead to renal failure. And that renal failure, you drop off the GFR. You don't filter off these waste products. You don't filter off sodium and water. And you end up activating your renin angiotensin aldosterone system. These are the negative things that you can see in nephritic syndrome. Some of these may sound similar though to nephrotic. Nephrotic syndrome, they had hypertension, they had edema. Their edema was more due to what though in nephrotic syndrome? Low albumin, low albumin. This is more due to low GFR. So renal failure is gonna be in higher incidence in patients with nephritic syndrome as compared to nephrotic syndrome. Let's now move on to the next part. What is the cause? of the GBM damage. Next part here is we gotta figure out why is there GBM damage? What happened? What was the cause of the glomerular basement membrane damage that caused red blood cells and white blood cells and some protein, not 3.5 grams plus per day, but there's protein loss, right? What's the reason for this? And why are these patients at such high risk of rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis? Okay, well, I didn't tell you which are the types, not all of nephritic syndromes cause, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. I will mention which ones now, but I wanna go over the causes of each one of those as well. So there's a couple of these, all right? There's a lot of them. This is where it gets kind of stressful when you're a student learning all these nephrotic and nephritic syndromes. They're, they're sons of guns. But I think we got a good organization system here. So the first way that I want you to think about this is, is it an anti-GBM disease? Is it an ankylovasculitis? Is it hereditary nephritis? or is it an immune complex deposition? That's the way I want you to organize it in your head, and hopefully we can make sense of it now. When you think about anti-GBM disease, you're really talking about a disease called good pasture syndrome. And some of the things that you wanna look for in the, the clinical vignette is a patient who has had hemoptysis and hematuria. So they have nephritic syndrome and they have hemoptysis. That's really what you wanna be able to notice, is really look for a patient who has hemoptysis, and I'll explain why, and some type of hematuria, usually secondary to their nephritic syndrome. The other thing that you wanna be able to identify here is that there is a very specific cause. It's an anti-GBM antibody. And that's really where it's super interesting. So these patients have this anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody. And it's this antibody, and what it does is, look at this dang thing, it's mean. This antibody loves to attack a very specific part of the glomerular basement membrane. It likes to attack like this collagenous portion of the glomerular basement membrane. So we call it the non-collagenous portion. And it likes that not just in the glomerular basement membrane, but it likes it in the respiratory membrane. It has a very strong affinity for it. So what happens is, when it sees this protein, this non-collagenous protein, here on the glomerular basement membrane, it attacks it. And when it sees this protein here on the respiratory membrane, it attacks it. And what ends up happening is these antibodies, they come and bind to a portion of these membranes. And they'll activate some inflammation, they'll cause some damage to this respiratory membrane, and they'll also cause damage to the glomerular basement membrane. If you damage the GBM, what do you start losing? Red blood cells, proteins, white blood cells, all of these things start dumping into the urine. And that's where you'll get these features that you see in these patients. And so one of the biggest things is they're gonna have a lot of these anti-GBM antibodies that is the particular problem here. And you'll see in these patients that they will have features of nephritic syndrome via the red blood cells, white blood cells, and protein in their urine, right? And so you'll have red blood cells, you'll have white blood cells, and you'll have subnephrotic range protein in the urine. But you'll also cause damage and cause blood to leak into this 
alveolar capillary membrane and blood will get lost via the respiratory tract. When you lose blood via the respiratory tract, what is that called? <laughs> it's hemoptysis. And that's why we see hemoptysis and features of nephritic syndrome in good pastures due to the anti-GBM antibody. All right. The next one here is ankle vasculitis, and there's three types of ankle vasculitis. One is called GPA. Another term that you're aware of, just to be careful, is Wegener's granulomatosis. The second one is EPA, or eosinophilic polyangiitis. This is also known as Churg-Strauss syndrome. And the last one is MPA, microscopic polyangiitis. And that's just the only name for that one. So remember, GPA, Wegener's, EPA, Churg-Strauss, and MPA. And these, the name is usually the giveaway. There's ANCAs. <laughs> so there's some type of positive anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies that are present. All right? Now, here's where it's a little bit confusing. These antibodies that you have here, these ANCAs, what they do is they do not directly deposit into the GBM at all. What they do is, is they go and stimulate via their name, immune system cells. What kind of immune system cells? Well, the primary one would be neutrophils, but it can also activate monocytes as well. So you're gonna get some monocyte activation and you're gonna get some neutrophil activation. So you'll get some neutrophil and some monocyte activation, all right? So we're gonna stimulate these puppies. When we stimulate these, what they want to do is, is they want to go and infiltrate into small vessels in the body. And that's where the next little hint comes in. They like to deposit into small vessels in the body. And they like to cause a lot of cytokines to get released and a lot of inflammatory mediators that then cause glomerular basement membrane damage, which leads to the loss of proteins, red blood cells, white blood cells. So what are you going to lose? Red blood cells, white blood cells, and protein. Is it going to be nephrotic range? No. So that's the big thing for this one. But you're going to notice the big difference here is that this is no antibodies. It's immune. It's immune mediated. GPA, EPA, and MPA, it's not all of them that cause this. We have to have one. So these things like to go and attack other areas. And so that's where we should actually have a little bit more specificity here. And so what we do is, we actually look at these ANCAs. We look at the ANCAs and see which one it is that's actually stimulating these. And one, what you wanna know is, was it a C ANCA that was stimulating these immune system cells? Or was it a P ANCA that was stimulating these cells? Right away, that's very helpful in differentiating these. Because in C ANCA positive immune reactions, this is associated with Wagner's GPA. So GPA. P ANCA is associated with MPA and EPA. So then you're like, oh, well, dang it, I can easily figure out, you know, if it's GPA, but how am I supposed to figure out if it's MPA or EPA? There's one other difference. Eosinophilic. <laughs> this one's not eosinophilic. So one of the big things for this Churg Strauss is you want to look for big key buzzwords. Look for things like asthma and you also want to look for things like an increase in eosinophils. So look for it in uh, asthma. Here we'll actually do this two ways. One is I want you to look for the increase in eosinophils. So we'll draw these like this. And then I want you to also associate this with asthma. So if you hear EPA, which is the P ANCAs, look for lots of eosinophils or look for features of asthma. All right. That's the ANCA vasculitis. All right. So we now have an idea here between the ANCA vasculitis and the anti-GBM or good pasture. Here's one more thing. In the anti-GBM disease, or good pasture syndrome, and in ankle vasculitis, both of these have the potential to cause lots of inflammatory mediators and lead to rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. It's very important to remember. So in this particular situation, this disease can lead to rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, and this one can lead to rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. 
What was the end result of these is that this could lead to an early development of renal failure due to those glomerular crescents. And so it's important to remember that, that rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis can be seen in both anti-GBM disease and ankylvasculitis. And they have a very, very high incidence in this type of presentation. All right, so the last one here is just a rando. It's often the one that most people get right on the exam just because it's so random and so obvious. It's hereditary nephritis. So for this one, this was immune mediated by white, white blood cells. This one was antibody mediated. This one is genetic. All right, that's the name hereditary. What you want to look for in the hints is you want to look for like a child and you want to look for some other features. So another particular thing here is listen for sensory neural deafness because this is kind of some type of loss of the collagen within the cochlear membrane. Or you want to hear lens problems, anterior lenticonus. So there's kind of like the slipping of the lens. So they have visual and hearing problems in a child who also has hematuria. The question is, is how do they get hematuria? Well, the collagen, type four collagen. So the problem with this disease is there is a mutation where there is a decrease in what's called type four collagen. And guess where that collagen is actually utilized as well? It's used in the lens and it's used in the cochlear membrane. Guess where else it's utilized? In the glomerular basement membrane. If you don't have collagen, you're gonna make a good basement membrane? No. And so what happens is these patients get a very thin and dysfunctional, that's the term, dysfunctional GBM. And as a result, what do they lose a lot of in the urine? Red blood cells, white blood cells, and subnephrotic range, protein. So that is what you're gonna see here, my friends, in this one. You're gonna see this, and then you're also gonna see a very thin glomerular basement membrane. All right, that covers hereditary nephritis. So, so far we've covered three of these types of nephritic syndromes. Two of them thus far can cause RPGN, which can lead to renal failure, which is that acute rise in BU and creatinine, and you can have potentially some other effects like hypertension and edema. Now, we come to these next three, oh, actually four. We have the immune complex deposition. All right, for the immune complex de deposition, it is thus within the name. Anti-GBM was an antibody that deposited into the, GB, uh, the G GFB. Ankylvasculitis was immune system cells depositing into the GFB. Hereditary nephritis is you weren't making a GBM. These, you have an antibody and antigen complex depositing into the GFB. That's the difference. So there's a couple of these. How do we differentiate things? Well, first off, I want you to remember post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, IgA nephropathy, which can have another presentation of it called henoch shanlin papura lupus nephritis, and the last one is called membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis. In post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, the key thing that is going to trigger you to know that this is it is if you have a kid who just is one to, let's say, two weeks, one to two weeks status post strep infection. I, I think that's thus within the name. <laughs> but what happens is this strep infection in a child will stimulate very specific, so imagine here is the strep bacteria. And it's important to remember that this can be strep pharyngitis or it can be impetigo from the skin. So it can be a skin or strep throat infection. Either way, here's the bacteria, here's their strep bacteria. What happens is maybe there's a special little antigen special little antigen on the strep bacteria, and your body produces antibodies against it. And what happens is a piece of that antigen breaks off, okay? Pieces of that antigen from that bacteria break off. And you got a bunch of these things. Now look, here's the antibodies that I'm producing against that streptococcal antigens. These antibody antigen complexes can go and deposit into the GBM. But here's the big thing that I need you to remember. These have specific names and it helps us diagnostically. We can call these anti 
ASO antibodies or anti DNA B antibodies. And these immune complexes that we form as a result of this from the strep antigen can go and deposit into the GBM. Now look at this. Here we go. We got all these suckers here depositing into the glomerular basement membrane. And they, very, they deposit very specifically in very specific locations. They like to go right between the podocyte and the top layer of the GBM. We call that subepithelial deposition. So what happens is, as a result here, you get what's called subepithelial immune complex deposition. Do you see why we got that immune complex name there? And what happens is they cause inflammation. You know how they cause inflammation? Oh, shoot, son. They activate the complement system. You guys remember that, right? Like, you guys remember whenever you have an antibody that binds to an antigen, it activates these proteins. I'm gonna represent them in pink, pink here. It'll be this protein. We have like what's called C3, C4, C5, C6. All those, these are your complement systems. They activate the membrane attack complex. They act opsonize, so they make uh, bacteria very tasty for white blood cells. That comes in here. And they bind to these immune complexes. And they try to enhance the inflammation. But you know which complement proteins are very, very specific? C3. So you get what's called C3 complement activation. I can't stress the importance of this diagnostically. And that leads to GBM damage because of all that inflammation. And if you damage the GBM, what starts on coming on a leak it out, my friends? What happens? You lose red blood cells. You lose white blood cells. You lose protein. Is it nephrotic range? No. And that's the difference here for this one. So you're going to get a lot of these antibodies that'll cause subepithelial immune complex deposition, cause C3 complement activation, and increase GBM damage. Now here's one quick thing. When you activate these complements, what you do is you consume them. You consume them. And if I consume these complement proteins, what will happen to their levels after I consume them? They will decrease. So it causes C3 consumption. So C3 consumption. That's very important. All right. So that's post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Another big thing here. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis from this continuous GBM damage can cause rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which can lead to early development of renal failure, which can lead to renal failure. All right, so, so far, we've mentioned which ones are, have caused this, anti-GBM, we mentioned that it was also the uh, encovasculitis, and so far, post-streptococcal. Okay. To make your life easier, it's these first three. This one does not cause that, but we'll get to it. Our right, IgA nephropathy plus or minus henox shanlin papyrin. This is actually probably the most common, I'm gonna say this again, the most common nephritic syndrome. Key thing for this one is it's maybe one to two days, is it weeks, days, status post upper respiratory tract infection or some type of GIT infection. And that's really the big kind of cue here. And so it's some bacteria, virus, whatever it may be, let's represent this as the same thing. It's some type of like bacteria or virus, whatever it may be. It's got an antigen on it. That antigen is immunogenic. Our body produces antibodies. And these antibodies want to stick to it and activate it and cause it to become destroyed. What are these antibodies? These antibodies that we now kind of like stick to this area here, that are sticking to these particular antigens here, on the pathogen, these are IgA antibodies. These are IgA antibodies. And these immune complexes, what they will do is they will go in and they deposit it in a weird area. They don't deposit into the GBM, believe it or not. And what they do is they deposit into this tissue that's nearby. It's called the mesangium, that purple stuff there. It will then go and they will deposit into the mesangium. 
And when they deposit into the mesangium, they will cause a lot of inflammation. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna cause mesangial deposition. So they'll cause mesangial deposition. And what that'll do is that'll kind of activate an inflammatory response. It won't activate the complement system though, but it will lead to inflammation that causes glomerular basement membrane damage. But the key thing is that you see there's no complement activation here. So that's the big difference here is that you're gonna get mesangial deposition, GBM damage, and what happens when you damage the GBM? What do you lose again? Oh man, this is in brain, it's gonna be ingrained into your brain. Red blood cells, white blood cells, protein. Is it nephrotic range? No. And these are gonna be lost into the urine. There's one other thing that's a little weird and what makes this kind of a little bit more easier to diagnose. These IgA um, antibodies that are bound to these kind of like little immune, comp uh, to these antigens from a GI or upper respiratory tract infection, they can also not only deposit into the mesangium, they can deposit into other areas. They like to go and deposit into a couple places. So that way we remember this. It can go and deposit into the skin, into the abdomen, or into the joints. If it deposits into the skin, it causes purpuric lesions. These like purplish lesions on the baby's butt, on the child's butt. It also can deposit into the GIT, and this will cause abdominal pain. And it can also deposit into the joints and cause joint pain. So what you wanna look for is a young child who just recently had a respiratory or GI infection who's presenting with hematuria and potentially vasculitic lesions, purpuric lesions, abdominal pain, and joint pain. That is the big difference here. If you see this vasculitity, this additional step here, this, indicates Henoch, Shanlin, and Papira. So IgA nephropathy is just this part. It's just this part. I'm gonna put nephropathy. But if it's IgA nephropathy and these other vasculitic lesions, it's Henoch, Shanlin, Papira. All right. Does this one cause rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis? No. All right. Does this cause complement activation? No. All right, let's go to the next one, lupus nephritis. What's the key thing here? They have a history of lupus. <laughs> or if, they, if it's not diagnostic, you have to find features of lupus. Look for that malar rash or the discoidal rash or anemias and other types of features of lupus. But this is the big thing. In lupus, there's some type of tissue cell damage. Their cells are popping open. They're being damaged. And when these cells are damaged, they release out their nuclear material. There's nuclear material that are supposed to be present in these cells. Maybe some DNA, maybe some nuclear proteins, things like that. But when they bust open, they release out these antigens. And these antigens love to go and bind with specific antibodies that are you know, the problematic issue in these diseases. Guess what these antibodies are called? Oh, it's so beautiful. Anti-nuclear antibodies anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies if it couldn't get any easier, right? All right, so they will go and they will bind to these particular antigens. The problem is, is that these sons of guns will go and deposit into the glomerular basement membrane. You know where they like to deposit? They don't like to make our lives any easier. So with subepithelial, mesangial, they decided to be a little bit of cold and wet there. They like to do subepithelial and subendothelial. Overachievers, I think. So you got subendothelial, so between the GBM and endothelium, and you got subepithelial between the podocytes and between the GBM. And that's all gonna deposit in there. So what are you gonna get? Subepithelial and sub-endothelial immune complex deposition. And from here, this is gonna to lead to what? 
the same exact thing this did. You get those immune complexes in there. They're highly desirable for the complement system. So it leads to C3, complement activation. This will cause C3 consumption. So you're gonna burn through that. And it's gonna cause GBM damage because you're gonna cause so much inflammation. So now look at this. You get a lot of these, you get a lot of this, you get a lot of this, you increase your C3 consumption and you cause a lot of GBM damage. Whew. And as a result of the GBM damage, what do you get in the urine again? Red blood cells, white blood cells, and protein. Oh, I'm about to mess with you though a little bit. Is it nephrotic range protein? Yes. This is one of the few that causes nephrotic range proteinuria with nephritic syndrome features. So I want you to remember that this will have, I'm gonna represent this with a lot of up arrows. This will have nephrotic range proteinuria. It's one of the few nephritic syndromes that can have nephrotic range proteinuria. Unfortunately, this is what Selena Gomez had. All right. All right, we come to this last one here for the immune complexes. Oh, before we do that, actually. Lupus nephritis, I already told you, I kind of gave you a little hint here, uh, that post-streptococcal, IgA, henoxtral and papura, and lupus nephritis, they all can cause what? RPGN. This will also cause RPGN. So you can see rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis with lupus nephritis, and you can see rapidly progressive uh, glomerulonephritis with IgA nephropathy plus or minus helox and lupus nephritis. So again, three types of immune complexes that show RPGN is lupus nephritis, IgA nephropathy, and post streptococcal. And then anti-GBM and ankle vasculitis also can present with RPGN. Which ones do not present with RPGN? Hereditary nephritis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. Okay. The last one here is membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis for the immune complex deposition. The key thing for this one is that oftentimes it's primary. So oftentimes it's primary. We don't, in other words, it's idiopathic. We don't really know why it happens. It's just, it's there, okay? Sometimes it can be secondary. And the big things to remember is like hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, and a disease called cryoglobulinemia which is where you get a lot of these proteins that precipitate at um, less than 37 degrees Celsius. But in these particular situations, whether it be idiopathic or primary, I mean, uh, uh, idiopathic, which is primary, or secondary to these particular diseases, what happens? We gotta make things a little bit more confusing. MPGN has two types, type one, type two. Type one, what happens is whether it's idiopathic, we don't know the reason, or it's due to some type of infection some way, shape, or form, our body has an antigen that our antibodies like. So we have these antibodies. And unfortunately, there's no specific name to these antibodies. They're just antibodies. There's some degree of IgG antibodies, but we just don't have a beautiful name for them, unfortunate. But there is some antigen, whether that's idiopathic and we don't know what that antigen is, or whether it's due to an infection or cryoglobulin proteins. These things forms immune complexes. These immune complexes love to go and deposit into the GBM. And when they deposit into the GBM, these ones here, they like to cause a lot of deposition here. And these ones cause a lot of that subendothelial deposition. So what you'll get from this one is you'll get a lot of subendothelial deposition. And this will lead to, again, what kind of effects here? You'll get C3 activation and GBM damage. <laughs> so if I activate the C3 system, I'm going to increase my consumption of C3. And if I cause a lot of inflammation from these immune complexes, I'm gonna cause a lot of GBM damage. And what does the GBM damage look like in these patients? Well, if you don't know it by now, you better. Right, red blood cell loss, white blood cell loss, and protein loss. But I'm gonna mess with you again. You're gonna see all of these. 
But the question comes, is it nephrotic range proteinuria? Yes. There's only two diseases that have a nephritic syndrome with a nephrotic range proteinuria. It is lupus nephritis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. All right, so, so far, what I've noticed from this one is it's a little bit complicating, it's a little tough because I don't have a special antibody that's causing these immune complex deposition. I just, I just don't have it. I just know that they're depositing there, they're causing complement activation, GBM damage. The other one is type two. Type two is a little bit odd. There is an antibody. There is an antibody and we know the name of this antibody. You know what this antibody's called? It's called nephritic factor. It's called nephritic factor. This is again for type two, nephritic factor. That's what this thing is. What it does is it binds with a special protein that circulates through our body naturally. You know what that protein is called? C3 convertase. It's called C, so this antibody is called nephritic factor. This blue protein is called C3 convertase. Once these things bind together, they become crazy active. And what they do is something really cool. They take a molecule, so imagine this complex now, takes a molecule called C3. Oh, that sounds familiar. Let's actually make it black just so we can keep consistent with this. We have this molecule here, C3. What it's gonna do is, is it's going to literally take the C3 convertase. When this antibody binds the C3 convertase, imagine it causing it to become supercharged. And that C3 convertase will tear through the C3 and convert it into C3A and C3B. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna represent this by this arrow here. This reaction is highly effective. And you are going to massively increase the amount of C3A and C3B proteins. And guess where they like to go and deposit? Yeah, you guessed it. They like to go and deposit into the glomerular basement membrane. And when they deposit into the glomerular basement membrane, they make these big dense deposits in the GBM and cause GBM damage. So what will you see out of the result of this? You'll see glomerular basement membrane damage due to these proteins depositing in here. You're gonna get a lot of this damage here. What happens as a result of uh, glomerular basement membrane damage? I'm not gonna write it down. Red blood, because I don't have any room, <laughs> but red blood cell loss in the urine, white blood cell loss in the urine, and protein loss in the urine. Is the protein nephrotic range? Yes, because the only two types that give nephrotic range proteinuria as a nephritic syndrome is membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis and lupus nephritis. The differences between these is this is an immune complex which is formed by an unknown antibody in something else. Could be these, could just be we don't know what. Type two is, it, is an antibody we know. Nephritic factor binding to a protein that we do know. C3 convertase causing lots of these proteins to become hyperactive. That's the big difference here. So my friends, with all of these, what I want you to take away is which one was in pure antibody deposition? Anti GBM. Which one was ANCA associated with immune system deposition? ANCA vasculitis. Which one was hereditary? Alport syndrome. Which ones were immune complex that caused rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Boom, boom, boom. Which were the ones that actually could potentially lead to, in these particular situations, complement three C3 consumption. Boom, boom, boom. Which one did not cause C3 consumption? Boom. Now, with these, which is the most common type of nephritic syndrome? Boom. That's the big things that I want you guys to take away from this. Now what we need to do now is say, okay, I talked about a lot of nephritic syndromes. How am I supposed to be able to recognize truly the difference between nephritic and nephrotic? And then how am I supposed to be able to determine the exact type of nephritic syndrome? Let's talk about that. All right, my friends. So now on to the next part, which is how do I diagnose nephritic syndrome and truly be able to differentiate that between nephrotic syndrome, right? Because they can kind of be a little confusing. Well. When we talk about these in nephrotic syndrome, we said that the biggest thing to start off with is a urinalysis of the microscopy, because it's gonna often give you at least a prelude to thinking about which one it is. 
So if I look at the urinalysis with microscopy between these two, what were the big differentiating features? Well, first off, the pathophysiology, the basic pathophys. Nephrotic was podocyte dysfunction, right? So this is podocyte dysfunction. Whereas nephritic syndrome, the classic theme, is there's GBM dysfunction. So there's some type of glomerular basement membrane dysfunction. Whether this was antibody, immune complex, immune, uh, like white blood cell mediated or hereditary, all of it was GBM dysfunction. This one led to heavy, heavy protein urea and heavy lipid urea. And the key kind of big thing between these is that the protein urea here, we said, can't be truly quantified um, with like a, a urinalysis, like the dipstick. It can give you like if it's plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. This one would be pretty positive. It could be like plus three, plus four protein urea, right? But we're not gonna actually be able to quantify if it's greater than three and a half grams or more per day. We'll save that for the next step. What we could see is that there's a lot of lipid urea as well. And here's the other thing that can be somewhat helpful is with that lipid urea, when you look at this under the microscope, you'll see those fat oval bodies that we talked about that's consistent in patients who have what's called nephrotic syndrome. In patients with nephritic syndrome, where their GBM dysfunction occurs, they lose a bunch of different cells. They lose red blood cells, and I told you there was a very specific thing, that when you lose the red blood cells, it'll show that they're gonna have a lot of red blood cell loss, white blood cell loss, and protein loss. So they'll have red blood cells in the air. What do we call that? We call that hematuria. So that's hematuria. And when, if we were to actually examine this underneath the microscope, it would show those things called the red blood cell cas, or it could even show the acanthocytes. And we said that that was some big buzzword term. So watch out for lots of these kind of microscopic hematuria. The other thing is we said that we could find lots of, lots of white blood cells, but we said that this was called a sterile pyuria. It's not as diagnostic, but it is helpful to know because these patients will have no bacteria, right? They should have leukoesterases are negative nitrites are negative, and they shouldn't really have any urinary tract symptoms. That's kind of the big feature here. So we'll see that. And then the last thing here is that we'll have proteinuria. But is the proteinuria gonna be like plus three, plus four proteinuria? No, it may be like plus one, plus two. It's subnephrotic range, with the exception. What are the two exceptions? So we have to make like a little kind of like disclaimer here that this is also not necessarily the case for which two don't follow this rule. This would be the lupus nephritis and membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis. For these two, this is the, I'm gonna put a little like exception. We'll put EX. These are the except or exception, exception. And these, they will have plus three, plus four proteinuria. All right, that's the exception. But that's kind of one way of starting off by differentiating between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. Now, if I come to the next part here, which is like, okay, I gotta go and say, is it the urine protein, the 24 hour urine protein is the next step. So if we come down here, what we'll notice is, is we come to this next part, which is being able to quantify the protein loss. So how do I know if I've lost more than 3.5 grams per day or less than 3.5 grams per day? So in this particular situation here for nephrotic syndrome, I said it was podocyte dysfunction, right? So podocyte dysfunction. And if we come over here, we said that this is gonna be glomerular basement membrane dysfunction. Now the big thing to remember here is that this will help us to quantify. So when we wanna quantify the protein loss, that's really the key feature. And what I can do is I can do a 24 hour urine protein, where over a process of 24 hours, I collect their urine. Or I could do a one time spot urine albumin creatinine ratio. This is a great thing you can do at one time, done. And it, a good representation of the amount of protein loss that they're having. So if I look here for nephrotic syndrome, I would see proteinuria for both of them, right? 
But what's the dead giveaway? The proteinuria that you're gonna notice for nephrotic syndrome will be greater than or equal to how much? It'll be, so they'll have proteinuria, but this is gonna be greater than or equal to 3.5 grams. This will be less than 3.5 grams. And that's the big difference between these two is you're gonna have lots of proteinuria, lots of proteinuria, but the difference is, is that in the nephrotic syndromes, it'll be greater than 3.5 grams per day. In the nephritic syndromes, it'll be less than 3.5 grams per day, with the two exceptions. So that's why I want you to remember here. What are the two exceptions here? The two exceptions are lupus nephritis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. These are the exceptions where they will have the actual 3.5. So we'll just put that these will be greater than 3.5, greater than or equal to 3.5. These are the only ones with that particular nephrotic syndrome based proteinuria, but they have other features of nephritic syndrome. So we kind of call them like a mixed or an intermediate kind of type. Once we've done this, we should have a pretty good idea now if a patient has nephrotic or nephritic syndrome. But there's one other thing I told you that really you should be on guard of. So when a patient has glomerulonephritis, it can be a nephrotic or it can be a nephritic syndrome. But what is really helpful is a decline in renal function. Because I told you, right, nephrotic syndromes, yes. Nephrotic syndromes have the capacity, no doubt about it, to cause renal failure. But nephritic syndromes can cause a very dangerous and rapid type of renal failure. And that's where I want you guys to understand here. The incidence of acute kidney injury and CKD is mountainly higher, significantly higher in patients who have what? Nephritic syndromes. Because of what? The risk of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And that is why this is the one that's a little bit more dangerous. And this is the one that if you were to test the renal function, you did a BMP, you would see more evidence of what? A reduction in GFR, an increase in the BUN, an increase in the creatinine. So these are the things that if you were to test, you would see an increase in the BUN, the creatinine, and a decrease in the GFR. So an increase in the BUN, the creatinine, and a decrease and the GFR could be indicative of glomerular injury, right? More specifically seen in nephritic syndrome as compared to nephrotic syndrome. Remember, nephrotic syndromes like focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, diabetes, amyloidosis can cause CKD. They can also to some small degree cause AKI, but you're more likely gonna see this with your nephritic syndromes. Okay, let's now move on to the next part, which is okay. We have now diagnosed a patient pretty clearly with nephritic syndrome. How do we know what the specific cause of the nephritic syndrome is? It anti-GBM, ankyovasculitis, hereditary, immune complex? Let's go through that next. We think we have a patient with nephritic syndrome. What do we wanna do now? Okay, we wanna go ahead and say and think, okay, I know that it's GBM dysfunction. I just don't know how the GBM is getting destroyed and dysfunctional. Well, I know that if I, we think about anti-GBM disease, that was one particular way. Well, how would I know if it was anti-GBM disease? Take into consideration the hints that I told you about. So in other words, what you wanna be looking for for this particular patient is, is there any features of hemoptysis, right? So is there any hemoptysis? That's one particular thing that could be kind of like a trigger to think about this. But then you can check the labs. So when I do the labs for these particular patients, what's the specific antibody that deposits into the glomerular basement membrane? They would have a positive anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody. So a positive anti-GBM antibodies. And that would kind of be like the telltale sign. I wouldn't really need to do much else other than that, right? Well, that's the first one. Pretty straightforward, right? So look for evidence of hemoptysis. And if that's not enough, look for that term of having the positive anti-GBM antibody. All right, what about the ankylvasculitis? I think the big things to think about for this one is, <laughs> it's kind of like pretty obvious here, you need to test positive for the ankas. So look for the actual ankas. So if I have a positive C anca, so that's the, the, 
the C anca. What did I tell you that was suggestive of? I told you that was suggestive of GPA, which is also known as Wegener's granulomatosis. So if I see a positive C anca, I definitely want to go thinking about GPA. What's another thing that also can make me think about GPA just to add to the, the help of diagnosing it? Look for evidence of chronic sinusitis. That's usually a really, really big one. So look for chronic sinusitis. And whenever you see that in the exam, plus them also having features of nephritic syndrome, that also adds to the diagnosis of GPA or Wegener's. If they are positive for the P anca, what you wanna look for here to really help you is, if it's P anca positive, I wanna know, is it eosinophilic polyangiitis or is it microscopic polyangiitis? Right, and this is also known as Churg-Strauss. So how do I differentiate between these two? Well, I told you that in microscopic polyangiitis, there's really no eosinophilia, there's no asthma. Whereas, and let's actually, just so that we have space here, we're gonna swap these up here. This is gonna be eosinophilic polyangiitis and microscopic polyangiitis. But in microscopic polyangiitis, they will be P. anca, and they'll have no asthma or eosinophilia. And eosinophilic polyangiitis, they will have positive features of asthma, and maybe it's positive for eosinophilia, and maybe even other features of allergies. That's suggestive of EPA, okay? So look for the ANCAs, and depending upon which one it is, it can kind of stratify out the different types. All right. Hereditary nephritis or Alport syndrome. It's really key, we already said this, it's just a constant reminder. Look for features of sensory neural deafness. Look for features of, what else? Look for anterior lenticonus, so lens problems, anterior lenticonus in their exam question. Look for features of sensory neural deafness, which you can determine by that Weber and Renee's test. And then you're usually gonna see this in some type of child who also has an associated glomerulonephritic syndrome type of presentation, okay? And usually this might have to be some type of genetic testing that you'll do. All right, here's where it gets a little bit more challenging. Immune complex deposition. How am I supposed to differentiate these dang things? All right, here's the first thing I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and say, okay, which one, which one had the anti ASO antibodies. Which ones had the anti DNA B antibodies? That was post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And that would be one way. So if I found positive anti ASO, positive anti ASB, DNA B, I'm going to think about post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. What are some other big things that would cue you off in the history? A recent strep infection. So look for also just like an add on. Recent, and when I say recent, we actually should be very, because they'll try to trip you up on this in the exam. One to two weeks status post strep infection. All right, one to two weeks. Just be careful, because they may present like the child had an upper respiratory tract infection, which could be strep one to two weeks ago. Whereas if they say one to two days ago, they had a upper respiratory tract infection, it could be IgA nephropathy. So just be careful. All right. If I said, on top of this, all right, here's another add-on that I could do here, just to make, make things even more interesting. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, what, what happened with the C3 levels? Do you guys remember which ones were the ones that caused complement pathway consumption? PSGN, lupus nephritis, and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis all consume C3 levels. So what would the C3 levels be for this one? It would be low. So if they have a low, C3 level, that would be potentially suggestive of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. All right, what's another one? All right, let's keep going. Let's say I go to the next one, which is, I have low C3 levels again. Okay, well that only leaves me with a select few. If I have a low C3 level, that's only lupus nephritis, post-streptococcal, and membrane proliferative. That makes things a little easy. What if I said that their antibodies that were positive is anti-neutrophilic, uh, or sorry, I'm sorry, ANCA, I'm sorry, ANA, anti 
nuclear antibodies, I apologize, anti-nuclear antibodies are positive, or anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies are positive. If I said this, what would you think about? What would be the one that you would think about? Lupus nephritis. Lupus nephritis. And look for, in their history, some degree of a history of SLE. Or look for features of SLE. Okay? If I said, this patient also has a low C3 level, so I'm consuming my complement proteins. Well, I already got PSGN, I got lupus nephritis. What's, this, what's the last one again? <laughs> oh, membrane proliferative, because IgA nephropathy is the only one that does not have low C3. That's helpful. Well, is there any antibodies that are really positive for this one? Not really. There's not really anything specific. Because remember I told you, the IgG antibodies that bind to some idiopathic or the infections, there's not something that we specifically look for with that one. And the nephritic factor antibody is not really something as well. You can potentially take those into consideration. So sometimes, if possible, you can consider testing for that nephritic factor. So you can consider testing for the nephritic factor, which was that in type two. But oftentimes, this one's not super obvious. It's really not super obvious. And oftentimes for this one, you may have to progress to a biopsy. You may have to progress to a biopsy to confirm the membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. It's not an easy one, right? Sometimes you have to go looking potentially for a biopsy to really, really confirm this one because it's the tough one to find. The last one here is if that C3 level is completely stone cold normal. So if the C3 level is normal, what could I do? Could I test any antibodies? You can, you can test for the IgA antibodies, but they're not very specific. They're not very good. So they're not very good test to kind of really go off of, even though it really makes perfect sense. They're not a great one. What you would wanna look for is, is there any evidence of IgA vasculitis? Is there any evidence of like henoch shanlin papura So in other words, do they have the skin, the papyric lesions, the GIT problems, the abdominal pain, or the joint problems? That's very, very helpful, okay? And another thing that's really, really key to kind of uh, like really nailing down the diagnosis of IgA nephropathy, henoch shanlin papura is looking for that key kind of like buzz term in here, which is the child just recently had one to two days status post upper respiratory tract infection or a GIT infection. So the antibodies aren't super great. Looking for evidence of IgA vasculitis in the form of henoch shanlin papura is really helpful and looking for that recent history of infection is even more important. So off of this, you can kind of get an idea of how to differentiate these things. So if right away, check the C3 levels. If the C3 levels, C3 levels are low, it's these. If the C3 level is normal, it's likely this. If they have very specific antibodies, it can point to these. If it doesn't really have a specific antibody, you may be thinking about MPGN. Right? especially if the history isn't here. And oftentimes you really may need a biopsy to confirm that one. But if the history is all perfectly there, the C3 level is completely stone cold normal, and you got that vasculitic lesions, you gotta think about the most common type of nephritic syndrome. All right, so that leads us to the next step here. I've done all these tests. The serology has been pretty good, man. It really has kind of led me. There may be like one, uh, maybe two of these that are really kind of tougher to diagnose. The only time a renal biopsy is truly necessary is if the cause of nephritic syndrome is super unclear and it's affecting your treatment or if they're developing renal failure, like RPGN, or they have persistent hematuria that's just not responding to therapy. Otherwise, we can honestly get the diagnosis without a biopsy if you get the point here. But if we did do a biopsy, we take a chunk of the kidney tissue 
And we take that tissue and we look at it under three different types of microscopy. One is we look at it under what's called light microscopy. It gives a general kind of like idea, a general change in the glomerulus, a general look at the glomerulus. Electron microscopy gives us a very detailed look at the actual GBM, the glomerular basement membrane. Super, super detailed look. But what we can actually do is, is we can do an immunofluorescence. And that's gonna look for those antibodies or immune complexes that are depositing into the GBM and highlight them, make them super green and fluorescent. And so what you're gonna notice is this is a really helpful test and light microscopy is also actually pretty helpful. So let's say that we go to the light microscopy. What is it really good for? One of the things I can get out of this one is I can get a general look, a general detailed change in the glomerulus. And that's really helpful. Because if I notice this, what is this? Crescents. If I notice I have some crescents that are present, some crescents, some glomerular crescents, this was suggestive of RPGN. What were the diseases that were associated with RPGN? Let's see if you guys remember, come on. Anti-GBM, which is also known as good pastures. Anca vasculitis. And there was three particular types of immune complex diseases. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, IgA nephropathy, and lupus nephritis. These all can cause these glomerular crescents, which was the, pr pr the parietal epithelial cell proliferation and then a lot of the fibrotic sclerotic tissue. This would lead you to think about these. And these are best diagnosed with this. All right, cool. Well, if they don't have the glomerular crescents, that only leaves two that we didn't mention in all of this madness. What are we missing? Well, we did anti-GBM ankyovasculitis, hereditary nephritis. That one was one that's not mentioned here. And what's another one that for the immune complex? MPGN. All right. When you look at the light microscopy for MPGN, or even, so you can get light microscopy, and even electron microscopy is actually pretty good as well. So even if you did light microscopy and electron microscopy, it actually gives this really cool look at the GBM. And what happens is, at the GBM, both, both, MPGN1 and 2, both MPGN1 and 2, have this weird thing where here's your glomerular basement membrane, and here's what's called your mesangium. And what happens is, these mesangial cells stick a part of their process into the GBM. And they give it this weird type of configuration, which when we see this, this is that buzzword term and why biopsy is helpful for MPGN. You hear the term tram track sign. When you hear that term tram track sign, I want you to associate that with MPGN type one or type two. That's the big thing, my friends. So once we've done this, we've done either light microscopy or electron microscopy, and we found tram tracking sign, we think about MPGN1, MPGN2, which is an immune complex deposition. The last one is actually the easiest one, thank goodness, that leaves Alport syndrome. You're missing type four collagen. <laughs> so it causes a thin, very thin and split glomerular basement membrane. And when you think about that one, I want you to think about Alport, syndrome, Alport syndrome. All right, my friends, we move to the next component here, which is I've done the light microscopy. What I really can use this for is I can say, is it Alport done? I don't really need to do anything else. If I find this on Alport, I'm done. If I see this on MPGN, so if I see the tram tracking sign, it could be type one, type two. I still don't know if it's type one or type two yet. So that's, I still got to do some further testing. And then if I see glomerular crescents, it could be any of these. I just don't know which one it is. So how do I delineate this? All right, watch this. For the linear, it's only one type. Only one type gives these antibodies the deposit in a linear fashion on immunofluorescence. And that's anti-GBM. That's anti-GBM disease. So good pasture, done. If it's posse immune, what the heck does that mean? There's no immune complex. Do you see any immune complexes in here? No. What's the only one of these that I mentioned, besides Alport syndrome, that has no antibody or any immune complex deposition? Ankylvasculitis. 
So Anca vasculitis will show no immune complex deposition. Technically, if you wanted to be very, very particular, even you know Alport syndrome won't have that as well. All right, we'll have posse immune. But that's one right there, okay. That leaves this last one, granular. The granular one could be post-streptococcal, it could be IgA nephropathy, it could be, what else? Well, generally it's post-streptococcal, lupus nephritis, and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, type one and type two. IgA nephropathy probably won't have to really do this part here. But here's what you'll do, and I'll actually put the IgA nephropathy over here, because it does something a little bit different. But when you look at the GBM, you're looking for this granular appearance. That could be PSGN, that could be lupus nephritis, that could be MPGN1, and that could be MPGN2. How do I know the difference? Because they're all granular. This one takes on what's called a lumpy, I'm not even kidding, the lumpy bumpy appearance, all right? And it's usually sub-epithelial deposition. This one is sub-epithelial and, so we'll put sub-epithelial and sub-endothelial deposition. MPGN, it gives immune complexes, immune complex deposition. MPGN gives C3 dense deposits. That's kind of the big difference here. So that's what you're looking for within these to kind of really highlight the specific type of nephritic syndrome. So once we've gone through all of this, if we haven't been able to figure it out off of the serology, some of the historical factors, you can do a biopsy, get the light microscopy, look for the crescents. If you see the crescents, it's any of these. How do I differentiate? Immunofluorescence. If it's linear, GBM. If it's posse immune, ankylvasculitis. Is it one of these? You have to go and look at the actual granular appearance and then some specifics to the granular appearance. If it's lumpy, bumpy, subepithelial, PSGN. If it's subepithelial and subendothelial, it's lupus nephritis. If it's immune complex deposition in the subendothelial layer, it's MPGN1. And if it's C3 dense deposits, it's MPGN2. The only last one that I want to add in here, because it doesn't even deposit really into the GBM, it deposits into the mesangium. Do you guys remember that one? The mesangial deposition? That would be IgA nephropathy. So if you see this one, this would be IgA nephropathy. And that would be indicative of mesangial deposition. So we'll write that one up here. Mesangial deposition. All right, that's the big difference here. All right, so now we've gone through, we've figured out every single type of nephritic syndrome in great detail. How do we treat this thing? So, when we talk about the treatment of nephritic syndrome, it's really treating the complications, and it's nothing crazy. Proteinuria, what did we do for that nephrotic syndrome? We kind of tried to be careful with the protein diet. So maybe just back off a little bit on that protein diet. You might have to lose the gains a little bit. The other thing I told you, which was that cool mechanism, was the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. These were really cool as well, why? Well, you guys remember that ACE inhibitors and ARBs, what was really cool about these puppies is that they kind of worked on that efferent arterial, remember? They helped to cause like the efferent arterial to vasodilate, which helped to allow for more things to leave the glomerulus. So it would be these or ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and these are great for that. Edema, fluid, and sodium restriction would be great because you're already gonna be retaining a lot of that, and then if that doesn't work, if the fluid, fluid and sodium restriction doesn't work, then you can consider diuretics. Hypertension, what's the drug that would inhibit? Because what's the problem with this one? We said it was that low GFR led to renin angiotensin system activation. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, these are the best because they're gonna shut down that renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Last thing here is treating the cause. And the real reason why we have to be able to treat this is because we can't let these patients develop renal failure. They have a very high incidence of renal failure. 
if the patient ends up leading to the risk of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which we said was a bunch of these, right? Which ones did we say was the particular scary ones that I want you guys to be able to realize? The ones I said that are really important to be able to realize here is anti-GBM, anca vasculitis, or post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, IgA nephropathy, and lupus nephritis. All of these have the potential to cause rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So what we want to do is, in this particular scenario, for these, is you really wanna start off with steroids. So we're gonna do steroids acutely. Okay, we're gonna do steroids acutely. And if the patient's renal function does not improve, what we would want to consider here, right? So if the renal function continues to decline, so let's put like there's the renal function continues to decline. Then we will progress to something else. And it's only specific to two types of diseases. We can do something called plasma phoresis. And plasma phoresis is where you're basically trying to like strip all the immune complexes out of the bloodstream that's causing this problem. And the two diseases that this would be good for is gonna be anti-GBM and anca vasculitis. That's the only two diseases that this would actually help. So anti-GBM and anca vasculitis. These are kind of like your emergent therapies to really get this under control. If you gain control, so if renal function maybe continues to improve, then what you want to be able to do from here is, is prevent further destruction. So you can see this in RPGN. So this would be an RPGN and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. So now we're at this point here. Well, we tried the steroids acutely, we got it under control if it was RPGN. If it still wasn't under control, then we go to plasma phoresis, right? Specifically for these. If the renal function is actually stable, so let's say stable renal function, maybe it's some degree stable, but we still don't want this disease to progress. What we may have to do is if they have rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or MPGN, so we'll put this or MPGN, then you may need to do some type of long-term immunosuppressant. So then you may need to do a long-term immunosuppressant, right? And the drugs that we usually do in this particular situation would be things like uh, cyclophosphamide and tacrolimus. These are generally pretty good drugs for these particular indications. So cyclophosphamide, and tacrolimus. Now, sometimes in this particular situation for the RPGNs, we definitely wanna get steroids going and get the plasma phoresis. You can consider also giving steroids and the membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis as well, all right? But you generally will not go to plasma phoresis ever for membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. It's usually only RPGN that is of this particular flavor. So RPGN or membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, with only the RPGNs are these, you do steroids acutely. If they have MPGN, you can also do steroids acutely. If the patient continues to have deterioration of the renal function and they have anti-GBM or ankylvasculitis, you can do a plasma phoresis. If their renal function is stable, but you want to prevent the continual progression of the RPGN, or the MPGN, then you can add on a long-term immunosuppressant like cyclophosphamide or tacrolimus. All right, engineers, in this video, we talk about nephritic syndrome. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.